today with me, I have DC Blocks Wavick, I have Dark Points Hugh uh, Karspekin, and Bluebird Network's Bruce Garrison. Gentlemen, welcome, and uh, thank you for joining today and spending part of your day today. It's great to be back here at NIDAS. Uh, it's been real fun to, to join these panels, so a special thank you to uh, Alyssa and team. Today's discussion is around the shifting role of data centers at the edge. And you guys have had a lot of things going on. And really, for, the, for our audience today, it's, it's really focused on, uh, on uh, connectivity because that, that seems to be a common thread and a common theme amongst each of your uh, companies. I'm going to ask Jeff to go ahead hear any of you and see any of you. Uh, introduce himself. But if I could, for a second, I'm going to try to reload this page, uh, I guess. Busy, busy year this year. Expansion in Birmingham, Alabama, one megawatt uh, enhancement of power. Uh, they just did a significant financing close and now just uh, broke ground on uh, a Greenville uh, data center and the construction to, to commence. So, uh, Jeff, please uh, introduce yourself and welcome. Are we having technical difficulties? Yeah, I think I think Jeff's having some uh, sound issues. He can't hear us, some of you but now we can hear, hear some him. Of you now. I reloaded. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Can you hear us? That's a yes. Okay. Is it my turn to talk? <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah. Welcome. <laughs> All right. So I, I I didn't hear the question. I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I reloaded the question. Okay. I think we're having technical difficulties. Go ahead, I got what, I'm sorry. I didn't hear the question. Tom, maybe we should repeat the question. Yeah, so um, uh, Jeff, uh, all Tom wanted you to do was introduce yourself. Mm -hmm. What a great way to do that, having technical difficulties. You gotta love it, right? <laughs> can you hear us, Jeff? <laughs> Jeff, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. he, may not, he may not hear us. So why don't we move on and we'll work through that um, on the back end here. And, uh, you know, you pick you you pick the next one. You got Bruce or Hugh here. <laughs> sure. Sure. So here, uh, as I said, you, you've had a, a busy start to the year. Congratulations on the acquisition of a, a Medion. That really gives you eight additional markets in the southeast and certainly supports uh, uh, your interconnection uh, strategy. So, Hugh, please uh, introduce yourself and thanks for joining. I'm kidding, actually. I, I can hear you just fine. I just thought I'd play a little joke on that one. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Hugh Karspekin, <laughs> uh, <laughs> co-founder uh, and chief strategy officer of Dart Points. Uh, yes, thank you very much, Tom. Yeah, well, we're very excited about that acquisition uh, and the expansion into the extra markets. Um, and also just, you know, heads down on our growth strategy uh, for 2021. Thanks again, Hugh. Uh, Bruce, good to see you again. Good to talk with you. You guys have been super busy as well. Uh, starting off the year with the acquisition of Cola Hub in Quad Cities, Iowa, uh, strengthening the 5G network to a fiber deployment uh, to over 500 towers uh, just last month announcing, and another uh, fiber expansion in the Midwest. So you guys have been super busy. And uh, Bruce, please go ahead and introduce yourself. Thanks, Tom. Uh, so Bruce Garrison, uh, I am the Chief Revenue Officer of uh, Bluebird Network. Uh, and uh, yeah, this this topic is very relevant for Bluebird uh, because uh, generally speaking, the markets we operate are in the edge, both from a fiber infrastructure and a data center, or what, what may be considered as the regional edge today. So uh, at the Plenty of expansion going on in both densifying metro networks, added a new data center, as you said, Tom, uh, in the uh, North Iowa area, uh, and will continue to be acquisitive uh, and add infrastructure to our footprint. Thank you, Bruce. So, uh, and hopefully we can have Jeff join us and uh, work out those technical uh, difficulties. But uh, you know, I just wanted to set the stage before we get into our uh, topics of discussion and, and questions. But 
listen, we, we can all agree that we're in the midst of a digital acceleration, right? That the transformation is, has already taken place, but really uh, we're actually in a digital acceleration. And there's really a fundamental re uh, in it occurring before us. Uh, and, and I believe that that's happening in, in two different ways. One will be a geographical expansion around major metropolitan areas, but the other really what we're focused on today is, is around highly specific locations. And, and both uh, Bruce and you, you guys really listen to your customers and that dictates uh, where that next edge data center will be. Some of the driving factors at the edge is 9 billion devices are currently connected and we believe 30 billion devices will be connected by 2030. Uh, the continued emergence of 5G and AI is certainly a, a significant factor. So really every company is working through this transformation. And just tell us, what are your clients looking for? And, and what are some of the requirements that you're seeing uh, that are driving where that you locate these, these sites? Bruce? Sure. Um, so uh, our customers, uh, when you think of what, about what Bluebird, the, the markets that we operate in, uh, it is generally the secondary and tertiary markets of the Midwest uh, with the mission to connect those markets and get them back to the major markets where more, more where today more of the eyeballs are uh, today. Uh, and what, what our customers are expecting at the edge, it's really just a repeat of what's already available in major markets. You just have more regional hospitals, healthcare companies, more regional banks, more uh, education institutes, wanting the same technologies and the same use of applications that the larger, the larger national enterprises are using. Uh, and so to do that in a city like Springfield, Missouri, uh, St. Joseph, Missouri, Columbia, Rockford, Illinois, you are you are having to push the network uh, and those applications and softwares closer to those customers, and therefore, it, it is just a repeat of uh, you know, give me what the big enterprises use. Uh, I want it on a smaller scale and closer to me, and that's that is what that is that is the theme we follow into these new networks that we're expanding into, or these new markets that we're expanding into. It's like a delay, it's always a delay, huh? I need mean, better networks. Jeff, do we hey, have sir, you Can you hear me now? Can you see me and hear me? Jeff, I hear you. Okay. I think like Tom is the one that's on uh, high latency network or something. Jeff, can you hear us okay? I can. I can. Sorry, I, I, uh, I, I'm that rebel right now. I got the, Perfect. I got that Linux laptop and, and. There we go. Great, Jeff. Uh, to kind of catch up. Again, to catch up with the question I asked you and, and, and Bruce, is that every company is working through the transformation. Uh, what are you specifically your clients looking for and, and, and some of the top three requirements you're seeing for your customers? Uh, I, I know you guys look, uh, look very closely at, at your customer requirements and dictates. Uh, where exactly you guys will, will build your next site uh, and connect that uh, with an ecosystem of, of network connectivity. Perhaps you can share that uh, with our, our audience. Okay, so I think, I think I heard most of what you said. I'm not sure if other people are having a hard time hearing Tom, but he was a little late enough. But I think he asked me, um, basically, what is the DC? Q, maybe you can give No, uh, Jeff, go ahead, I can, I can hear you. Okay. Did he did he ask me what the, to basically describe what DC Block does? Is that it? Uh, and I'll, I'll, which customer sections and 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 that you the needs that you guys are. Uh... Okay. So 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 the, the mission of DC, DC Blocks. So so I'll just you know I think you asked me to introduce myself a while ago. Let me just jump in and do that real quick, and then we'll spring forward. So um, I have my official title is Chief Strategy Officer for DC Blocks. I've been around since the early days, you know, back in like 2013, 2014, when we were doodling on cocktail napkins about how to build a modular efficient ecosystem of data centers designed to serve locally but connect globally um, and, and you know we really have realized that vision over the course of the last six years and, and we've recently you know acquired some more some more capital to move forward to continue the expansion but dc box mission is to is to build these modular efficient data centers that are well connected in what we call underserved markets um, you know the definition of underserved is kind of left as an exercise for the reader but suffice it to say 
you know, we listen to our customers, and there are many out there who have been neglected simply because they don't live in an NFL city. So I mean, we, we've gone through a great exercise and a methodology to understand you know, where is their need, what is the need. Um, and it's sometimes where you least expect it. Um, and there's other places, I think in Birmingham, um, you know, we're the first tier three data center in the state of Alabama, and there's a lot of great business in Alabama. And so that was a, a whole state essentially in a, in a metropolitan city that had been completely neglected to a large degree. So um, we're, we're continuing that, that expansion as we move out into other parts of the country. And, and the question about, you know, what customers do we target? The answer is sort of all of them, right? So the, the key is, who are the customers that are neglected? They can be in all verticals. We have customers in legal, in healthcare, in government, education, you know, small mid enterprise types. Um, we have some mom and pops as well. They just need a, a, a place to keep their equipment cold and safe and dry and well connected to the world. But the key in all of these cases, no matter who the customer is, you know, it's, it's obvious that, uh, I'll use the phrase again, cold and safe and dry. So you, everybody needs to have their equipment someplace safe is their key critical IT infrastructure. And, and once that is in one of our facilities or presumably any facility, um, the next most important thing is how does the customer and their employees and their customers have access to that equipment 24 by seven by 365 with high bandwidth, low latency connectivity to anywhere in the world. So the mission of DC Blocks is not only to build these bunkers out of concrete and make sure that they, make sure that they're the place that you wanna go when the hurricane hits, right? Cause you'll be safe inside the building but also to make sure that the connectivity never goes down, along with, of course, the power and the cooling never going down. So that's that's the mission. So we're as much a networking company as we are a data center company. And, and customers who have that connectivity component are drawn to us. Um, we're working with a customer right now for whom we are custom building a dark fiber-based 2.4 terabit network that has to carry 106 discrete services. And, you know, usually a, a customer would go to AT&T or to CenturyLink or something like that excuse me, Lumen, um, and, and get that done. But instead, they're coming to us because we know how to do it. And we do it every day. It's, it's not a science experiment for us. Um, we, we've been running on dark fiber with uh, carrier grade optical transport gear since since day one. So it's really just a matter of course for customers. Um, I'm going to assume the question will come my way, so I'll get right in there. Um, the uh, uh, well, thank you, Jeff. And, and Hugh, if you could please uh, give us your perspective on on absolutely, absolutely. So, like Bruce and Jeff, uh, uh, Dart Points is is focused on uh, the smaller tier twos, tier threes, and let's go even further and make up another category, tier fours, um, where we are really pushing out um, uh, that remote edge. Uh, again, very similar with regards to uh, our customers are, are looking for professionally managed data centers. They're looking for uh, sites that appear to be data centers. Um, they are not looking for um, uh, uh, the, the, the traditional central offices and things that uh, the deeper you get out into the network uh, are the types of facilities you end up having to deal with. Um, and so uh, we are trying to get um, uh, we dark points builds uh, owns and operates uh, data centers into these markets um, and we look to bring back uh, that uh, connectivity to the more centralized again what we call the regional hub uh, we focus on the data center space um, we've got cloud assets uh, we just deployed one of the commercially available uh, one of the fastest commercially available servers um, out in Iowa uh, last week um, which is uh, it's it, it uh, which is a uh, quite uh, an interesting achievement given the fact that this thing the single server is four and a half kilo <laughs> kilowatts so that's a pretty hot server um, but being able to do that in these remote locations and be, be able to provide that type of asset um, for our customers to use uh, again the customer sets um, are, are across the board we focus on the ecosystem uh, we believe that these are are, are locations that um, need to uh, be able to service everyone's needs, not just the data center's needs. So we make sure that there's a timing and sequence of these, who comes in first, who buys from whom, uh, upstream, downstream effects. Um, and those customers range from the carriers to the FAMGAs, uh, to the enterprises. Uh, and, and the farther out you go in these markets, the, the more you'll see those types of players, the hospital systems, uh, the local municipalities, the police departments uh, that, are, again, are looking for that connectivity, uh, the compute and the data center resources. Back to you, 
Thanks, you. So, again, as much as we want to put the pandemic behind us, uh, I think it's important to discuss uh, how has the role of or and the evolution of the Edge Data Center uh, shifted during this pandemic. Uh, Jeff, we'll, we'll start with you. What are you, what are your thoughts on that? On on uh, how this this has impacted uh, these edge yeah. data centers? Okay, sure. Um, so, 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 so kind of hard to know in some cases, right? I, I think overall, uh, as we entered the pandemic, we had, you know, if you want to call it a pipeline of customers, we had customers that were installed, they were happy, life was good, you know, a, a new sequence of customers that are always the ones that you're, you're, you're hoping will, will decide to become part of the family. And, and when the pandemic hit, you know, some of those just stopped. And I think it, it may have been fear in the market of not sure what comes next. Is the stock market going to crash? Is this ever going to come back? What happens? Does the whole world die? Um, you know, is this is this the uh, the pandemic that wipes wipes out humanity? Um, but at the same time, we saw a lot of, of resurgence in in Russian data resurgence. We saw a big surge from I don't want to say unlikely places, but but as many of our customers or potential customers who went dark, we had customers that suddenly came out of nowhere and said, "Holy cow! Now that the pandemic has hit, all of my people are working at home. All my transactions are happening in a different way. My business has shifted. I need to make these changes. I can no longer have." my two people manning my data center in my own basement of my building because I get sick and what if they get sick and then I've got nobody to manage it. We need a protected infrastructure. So um, <laughs> candidly, candidly, I think, you know, the, the whole pandemic has really accelerated the concept of what we call, what I like to call remote humanism. I think, you know, while I'm in, in downtown Atlanta or midtown Atlanta here and I can look on 85 and see that there is again a lot of traffic out there. I think for the most part, we've now realized a paradigm shift and how we're all going to work um, in, in, in the world and with each other. And it's going to be very remote. It's going to be data intensive. It's going to be connectivity intensive. And we've certainly seen that acceleration. Um, and I don't expect it to change. I, I think that we're not going back to where we were 14 months ago in terms of how people view Zoom as a viable way or, or whatever tool is a viable way to conduct a meeting. And, and it tends to drive our business more. So there's some burps. I think there was some economic uncertainty, uh, but a lot of that has settled out now. And uh, it seems sort of full speed ahead for us. I agree with you. Bruce, want to share your perspective? Yeah, sure. Uh, so, you know, I think I think Jeff used a word that I would I would just uh, use again, and that is uh, accelerate. You know, I'm not sure if the pandemic has shifted much of our the the creation of or the use of edge data centers. Uh, I I think the big thing that's shifted it the most is our use of data uh, in running a business. Um, you know, whether it's all these, whatever, AI, Internet of Things, all these connected devices that you mentioned, just the more intense use of data is what is requiring more efficiency, less latency, um, and, and all that means you got to be closer to the users of that data. I do think the, the pandemic's accelerated it. I think there's certain industries that's made it, exposed it as, uh, as if you're not going in a digital direction, you're in trouble. Um, so I think the pandemic has accelerated, but I think the biggest driver is just our use of data uh, and, you know, the serving video customers from Dallas and Seattle is not enough anymore. Um, or, you know, a, a software that uh, an ERP or a CRM software and just serving it from the West Coast is not enough anymore. And these things have to be closer to the users. That's helpful. Hugh? So what I find interesting is all three of us on this panel have been looking at a different paradigm for quite some time. And so we are not surprised um, with, I mean, it's, it's, it's business as usual in many ways. Um, uh, the pandemic uh, strengthened the argument um, that Dark Points has been making is that it, the, the resources that are being requested are in the, are, are essentially um, needing to be in different locations, not a brand new location, but need to be distributed even further. Again, the terms that have been used here closer to the customer. Um, localization of not only data 
um, uh, but also of traffic, uh, people able to access the content, the local content, without having to hairpin uh, 800,000 miles away in some cases. Um, uh, that, that is not an efficient use. And um, when uh, the pandemic hit, uh, we saw a massive shift from networks that were linking commercial real estate properties to networks that were linking residential properties. Um, and yes, they do kind of all kind of tie in eventually, but, but the issue here is when that also is applying to the schools. Uh, we had a lot last summer uh, of dealing with all of a sudden, um, you've got this act of God with the pandemic, but um, for example, up in Iowa, um, they had a second act of God uh, with the derecho. Okay, which took out Eastern Iowa and, and other parts of Iowa, um, where all of a sudden the schools that they wanted to open up, I mean, resources, they needed to be reassigned. They needed to be replaced, not because they were wrong in an original location, but now you had, uh, when the network starts going down, those that performance gets even worse. Um, and so people are recognizing very quickly now that this duplication of resources in areas that people hadn't really thought about in the past are now very real. Um, and so uh, we've been focusing on that for us uh, since 2012 and, and, and really dropping uh, these locations and where in, in places where um, the people that will enact those types of resources and networks um, can, can, can provide the same service that you would expect in a tier one market. Yeah, that's, that's the key, right? Yeah. I, I said it earlier, but yeah, there's a whole set of, People, businesses, entities, whatever you want to call them collectively, who have been neglected. Um, you know, and, and you know, I'm sitting here again in, in Midtown Atlanta, but the DC Blocks facilities are kind of scattered around here, 100 to 200 miles away in, in cities that you know, people are accustomed to flying over. But guess what? People live there, they work there, they have important businesses there, um, corporate headquarters are there. And when those folks in those smaller markets have to put their stuff in Atlanta because it's the only place they can find a home. Um, then it turns into a logistical nightmare for them to to get to it. Do they have somebody that, you know, hire a new employee in Atlanta, or hire a new employee in Dallas, hire a new employee in Chicago, whatever it is. Or do you, you know, get a data center, a facility that's close to you and be able to drive there? Go hug your server if you need to. Some people like to do that, right? They don't want to do that miles away. They actually want to hug it. Um, so that's been a really important, right, is, is the locality. While at the same time, there are other folks who specifically want to push their stuff out of their market. They've got two data centers in market. And they realize that they're both on the power, same power grid, they're both on the same seismic zone, they're both on the same storm path. And they realize the disaster recovery strategy might not actually survive a disaster. So if we can help them, and you said the same thing, right? The key is in the distributed nature. Some yeah. people want to have things local, but you've got to connect globally and regionally, certainly, to be able to offer folks an option to do what I like to call disaster prevention. So I've got a third of my gear in city A, a third of my gear in city B, a third of my gear in city C. I can connect them all with the network, make them look like they live in all in my basement, right? Um, if a meteor falls from the sky and destroys city B, I still got two thirds of my stuff. I'm still in business. The network's still whole. That's the key, right? And every, everybody's got a different mission. Every customer has a different philosophy, a different set of legal and regulatory constraints that drives them to their, their methods and their thinking. And, and sometimes laziness is, is how they ended up being where they are. So we like to show them a way the future where they can actually have a preventative solution rather than a recovery solution. And it, there's been, uh, to add on that quick point, um, there's been a, a, a change in thinking how assets are deployed. And so we've seen um, that not only as of a couple of years ago, people had a, a handful of choices where they could place centralized uh, infrastructure. Um, now, um, they've got options of hundreds, okay, um, and, and demand for hundreds. Uh, software can be written for as little as 15,000 eyeballs, okay? So there's new revenue opportunities. Um, and now people are looking at, okay, how do I do this? And we have been focusing on uh, operations that are meant to be dark. Nobody's out there. So how, how, how do you maintain the site? How do you provide an, a, a solution um, a data, a digital solution to more of a logistical problem. How do you assist someone who needs to deploy two, three, four servers into 50 different locations across the country effectively without having to get on an airplane and do this, especially under the guide of guys of, of, of COVID. Um, so those have, 
interesting challenges that have been theoretical up to now, but now are quite real. Um, and you've got some very intelligent folks um, that are trying to solve that for their companies. And now we've got three intelligent folks here, not throwing you out of the mix, Tom, but uh, we're on the panel. Um, but, but, um, uh, but we've got intelligent folks here that are actually trying to kind of meet them in the middle and be able to help them do this and drive this. <laughs> well said. Yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, one thing that I want to do is kind of shift the conversation towards uh, security uh, concerns, right? On uh, the shifting role of data centers at the edge. I would love to get your perspective on uh, security. It's always been a big concern. And uh, Bruce, perhaps you can kick off uh, this portion of the of the conversation. Yeah. Um, so you know the Bluebird standard in operating uh, a data center. So our data center platform, you know, is in what we would consider secondary to tertiary markets. Um, and, you know, they're, they're, because of the same services, the same critical infrastructure, IT infrastructure that sits at these, they, have, they expect the same uh, security requirements uh, they do as if they're in, you know, downtown Dallas. So, um, you know, we, uh, we have the, it's a tier three certified, uh, facility, uh, in both locations, you know, uh, multi-step authentication, uh, you know, the 24 by seven man security, uh, it, it just, the general requirements of the data center, just the only difference is it's just at a little bit smaller of a scale, you know, um, uh, and our average customer size. Uh, is you know in in the uh, in the racks, not in the multiple megawatts. Um, so, but it, it, it's no different than um, you know us at Bluebird. If we choose to operate in a major market like Chicago, it would be a tier three facility, uh, and in the same expectations, just at a bigger scale in these bigger markets. But I, I don't I don't think the customer requirements are changing into the edge, at least on this what I call the regional edge. The micro edge, where there's many, many more devices or or, or uh, huts at the bottom of cell towers, I do think that you know the, the 24 hour man security, uh, all of those different things are going to change there. But but in this first phase of just densifying certain major markets and then uh, you know creating those ecosystems in the secondary and tertiary markets, these are just the same requirements on a smaller scale. Can I get a perspective on that? Absolutely. So uh, the customer's requirements for security, as Bruce mentioned, are not changing the, the farther out you get. Um, how we handle that um, uh, is where a lot of creativity comes into where, again, it's also level setting with regards to what, what to expect. When you've got a small site, you have fewer number of people there, okay? Which is actually in and of itself is, you know, back in the 90s when you would put a router online, you didn't broadcast the address and if nobody knew it was there, well, it was harder for them to go after it. Um, placing these sites in areas that people, the physical threat um, that are not necessarily recognizable as a telecom hotel, if you will, uh, from these remote sites is extremely important. Um, you don't advertise and televise that, hey man, I'm right here because then, you can have issues that do occur um, within the site. Obviously, uh, we, each one of our sites is fully compliant. Um, our sites um, also uh, uh, provide escorts, but we don't handle escorts with regards to the mindset of a traditional data center. You know, our, our, our technicians travel around very similar to the to the telecom technicians, you know, in packs of twos and kind of have got a serving area, if you will, in terms of how they do this. Um, um, as you get into the site itself, again, you have got, you know, there's folks that have tried to make the racks unbreakable, but they're not unbreakable. Um, uh, and, and you know, people can change things. So you've got to be very careful about who can touch power. How do they touch power when they're installing? Can you take anybody else out? So the co so, so we have focused on compartmentalizing one of our customers 
Um, and uh, and those assets, whether they're ours or our customers that are highly vulnerable, um, then we segregate them and we, we make sure that they are in, in something that cannot be accessed um, uh, beyond, uh, again, the traditional dual authentication, uh, updated access lists, uh, you know, we don't handle, I mean, we don't have punch codes. I mean, you know, people who come in need to show that they are who they are. And, and that's a logistical challenge uh, in term, because, you know, people do get sick. And so how do you get someone else out there that is sick? And we, we've got ways to figure that we've got ways to present that to our customer um, that are kind of, you know, kind of secret sauce stuff that we do to make sure that customers are never barred from getting into their uh, equipment uh, in the event of, let's say an illness, um, but also that the site is fully secured and all customers there that are, are, are secured as well. All right, I expect that Tom, we still having network works, is gonna ask me the question next. So I'm just gonna go. Appreciate um, it, thank you. Yeah. Jeff, your take on that? Yep, okay, so, so you know, I have to agree with Bruce and Hugh, right? I mean, I said it before in one of my previous comments, you know, when, when people become part of the DC Box family, we have to keep this up cold and safe and dry, right? So we have a team of, I like to call them professional paranoids. You know, I'm one of them. And, and we make sure that, you know, everything we do is in tune with keeping everybody's equipment cold and safe and dry. So there's components to this, right? One is what I'll call guards, guns, and gates. You know, I think I advocated for a, a facility design once that had a sniper tower. They rejected me. But, you know, guards, guns, and gates everywhere. You think about what could happen. Is a dump truck going to come down the street and smash into the building? Is a data hall behind another part of the building that can act as a crumpler zone? You know, all, all of those things that you, you, you fantasize about what could go horribly wrong. You know, the homogenous, you know, incursion where there's the guy with the black mask and he creeps in overnight and snips the wires. You know, that's it's not really practical. It's not how they do it anymore, right? It's 2021. So we think about all the components of security guards, guns, and gates, but then the, the information security side of it as well, making sure that all the systems, all the process, all the procedures, all the governance even right down to hiring employees, making sure they have background checks, all of that stuff, right? That everything we do is holistically sound and we seek independent third-party validation, right? It's not enough to say, my building is secure. You actually have to go off and, and get get certification, be compliant, get that independent third-party validation. At the end of the day, you know, we can, we can talk a lot about concrete, we can talk a lot about barbed wire, we can talk a lot about ISO 27001, and we can talk a lot about those things and they, and they all, they all converge into, you know, what I like to say from time to time is that, you know, we're not really selling data center services. What we're selling people is a good night's sleep. And, and how do you give them that? You give them that with quality, because quality, you know, people, quality of solution, quality of infrastructure, quality in terms of reliability is what allows people to get a good night's sleep. And, you know, people really appreciate that. So that's the key. I laugh at that good night sleep one. That's absolutely what we need. Thank you, Jeff. So <laughs> let us, let us shift, uh, I, and what it means is like looking I forward, forward, right? And oh, this is for, for all of you folks. <laughs> Tom, could you repeat that, please? Let's 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 talk a little bit about. Uh, I know we only have a few minutes left here. Uh, let's just talk a little bit about. Sure, uh, we only have a few minutes left here, so uh, I really. They want to talk densities and as as we look forward a few years down the road uh do you believe that we'd be challenged with power densities at the edge uh and the deployment of of ample power as we continue to evolve whether it's uh at, at the towers whether it's at at these small dense micro edge sites uh i'd love to get your perspective on power density First, why don't you go ahead? Sure. Um, I mean, yeah, mine's uh, kind of pretty short and sweet answer on that. We, we've seen no power density uh, issues in any of the kind of secondary markets that we operate in. Uh, and, you know, generally in the Bluebird footprint, there would be many more of those if we could add a data center. And I, and I think the theme would continue. I, I don't think I don't see any constraints in the current regional edge, uh, as I've called it. Uh, now, you know, these uh, micro edge, huts in the bottom of cell towers, uh, I, I think that once there hits a certain amount of scale and volume and, and power requirements at these smaller sites, yeah, I, I think you're going to run into some 
um, you know, some density issues. But that being said, I don't know if we're there yet to really be able to say it's a problem. Uh, I don't know if there's, you know, I don't know of applications that aren't being able to be effective at the micro edge yet. Um, but that being said, I think we're early into that stage and, and that could be the area where there's where there's more constraints than, than versus in this regional hub. If you were Jeff, you just jump in. Here, you're yes. I'll just, I'll just go. Um, so so I, I, agree, I agree with what you said, Bruce. Um, you know, part of this too is, <clears throat> There's a couple concepts I was thinking about while you were talking, right? One person's core is another person's edge, right? So what I think of as edge, you might think of as, wow, that's a big city, right? So, you know, there's a concept of sticking a little a little shack in the middle of a cornfield someplace and having a micro edge out there. It, maybe there's value in that, maybe there's not. Depends, I suppose, on, on 5G cell power placement, all that stuff, right? But um, a, a, as I think about power densities, you know, we, we know as an organization what we need to deliver in terms of, of megawatts, kilowatts, whatever it's going to be. And, and, you know, there's a methodology and you guys, you, know, you and Bruce, you know this, right? You don't, you don't just say, I'm building over there, <laughs> right? You say, I need to find the one or two street addresses in this market where I know that I can get the connectivity that I need, where I know that power companies deliver the power. And if I need a new substation, what's it going to cost me? Do I keep parking? So you don't just randomly say, oh, there's cheap dirt 46 miles out of town. I'm going to go buy the dirt um, because you could have a problem, right? You know, fiber costs $120,000 a mile to trench. Uh, I don't know how much it costs to pull in power infrastructure. 46 miles to do 10 megawatts or whatever. So you make smart decisions about where to put it. The micro edge stuff, you know, I, I, I question if that's ever really going to be a thing. Um, you know, if you've got, if you're an organization and you're running a thousand different micro edges, you've got a thousand boxes deployed out in the field. You know, how many truck rolls does it take to keep that stuff working? So I'd rather have connectivity to, to where I need and, and, you know, get, get us back to what I call the edge, which is, again, these, these underserved, um, often neglected markets. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll finish up on that. The we are. Uh, it's going to take a while for some of the the, the dense applications to make it out uh, into these uh, tertiary markets. Um, what one point I'd like to make is, uh, Bruce, you, you, the term you use is, is micro edge, and there's a lot of people think that, that a lot of these sites are small. And what's What's interesting, uh, so dark points can build a small site, but we're, we don't plan small. Um, and why, why I'm bringing up the differentiator here is that's how you address the density issues. So our sites, um, uh, we, are, we can move very easily into these smaller markets. Uh, we can get facilities going, and then we allow that local market to tell us, how are they using the site, okay? Um, uh, and some of these we expect. So if you have a lot of telecom providers, uh, your density is going to be maybe not so dense. OK, but um, our, what we are doing now is we are connecting local content with lo local peering and local interconnection. And, 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 and that will start driving some densities. Um, and um, we know that the you know, what, one of the issues of uh, there was a very early step into uh, uh, placement of sites at the base of towers, um, but um, ha having built out a lot of that cellular backhaul back in the early 2000s and understanding what those resources look like, there's a di this the, the the use cases are very different based on not only the the, the geography tier one tier two tier three markets but also um, in the actual asset. Like if you're in a, a, a high rise building or are you uh, are you at a base of a tower, the use cases are very different um, and they're not all the same. And if you think of like a tier one data center and how they view data versus a, 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 a tier one market data center versus a tier three data mar uh, market, um, the, it's very different. We see a lot of transactions. Um, and that don't quite require a lot of density. However, with that being said, we look at this, you know, we all take a look at the space power and cooling paradox, right? That we all, and, and, and dark points is no different on some of these sites that we look at, how we approach it is very different. And, and what's interesting, I, I referenced this server that we turned up uh, last week in Iowa, North Liberty, Iowa to be exact. Um, it's, it, it's, it's dual phase liquid immersion. 
Okay, so we are taking a look at how we can allow traditional mindsets and data centers to grow. Um, how do we allow the physical building to grow? Okay, and then actually, how do we allow density to take on new new footprints and new types of cooling technologies uh, in preparation for four or five years down the road where you are going to have someone who's going to come in here and be like, I, if someone were to come into a hut, we don't build huts, but into a hut at the base of a tower says, I'm putting 25 kilowatts in there. A, the business model has to support that amount of equipment that goes there. But secondly, there is no there is no chance in Hades that they're going to be able to get enough cooling in that hut to even remotely approach that 25. You just, you just physically can't, there's laws of physics. So um, unless you go into a brand new type of technology. And so we are trying to be forward thinking a lot of that, practicing it now, not only how do you deploy that new technology, how do you manage it and operate it in the same mindset that a traditional data center might. So it, we're not seeing the densities yet. We are planning for those densities though. I want to jump in and make a quick comment about, about density. We can kind of talk about applications. We talk about numbers, high, low, kilowatts. You know, I, I, I spent a lot of time in the 90s um, in, in London, England. And, um, you know, I was, you know, I first got there, I had been there before, I asked people what happens in London. Because, you know, in the, in the 70s, it was, you know, the UK was big industry, cars, planes, trains, automobiles, things like that. And I said, you know, what happens in London anymore? And, and one of my colleagues says, ah, we just push money around now. Right, don't really build anything anymore. We push money around, and I think that that paradigm is actually what's happening now in the in, in this business, right? I think there certainly are a number of applications out there that, that do a lot of compute, that generate a lot of heat, that need to be cool, that need a cold safe space. But what we see the, as the real area of density is in connectivity. You know, we're going to talk about five G. I don't know if we're going to have time. We only got four minutes, but you know, the the the, the hunger for just raw bandwidth to every device, and every set of eyeballs, is really the thing that we see driving. What happens next? So when I think about density, I think about communications density and connectivity density and, and carrier density and being able to have carriers and, and even us and, and you guys right here in these edge facilities. You know, sure you can backhaul everything to Dallas. Sure you can hairpin everything back to Atlanta through 56 Marietta if you want to. But the densities that we see happening are more about how do I get the density of connectivity? How do I build a nexus of connectivity in these underserved markets, right? To facilitate this huge glob of traffic that we're going to generate from 5G. It's not going to be autonomous cars, right? But there's going to be killer applications that are going to generate it. So, you know, I, I don't know that we're going to be, you know, I think Google and Apple store a lot of data, a lot of folks do, but I think, you know, much as London now just pushes money around, right? It's a financial center. I think this business is increasingly about pushing ones and zeros around, getting them from there to there. And maybe I have to sit over here in my data center for a little bit, but that's the density that we see. And that's one of the areas we, we, we are primarily focused is making sure that we can facilitate connectivity in any scale, you know, terabits and beyond. Bruce, any comments on that? No, I mean, I would, well, I guess I would agree, given that, you know, Bluebird is in the network business as well, I would agree with Jeff in terms of this, these edge, regional edge, micro edge, edge, whatever we want to call them, these data centers of, of all varying size, they're going to, they're, the network choices for the customers that select them is just as important as security or anything else. Uh, you know, it, uh, the carrier hotel and, and you're at 60 Hudson, Tom, uh, you know, the amount of carriers in there, is, I don't I think it's close to 100. Um, you, you, you're not going to see that same scale, but you cannot turn up a, a data center without, you know, multiple five, six choices of networks. And, and then once the networks are there, then you're going to get content put, push closer. And then that densification is just going to continue. So this is, you know, tackling the edge is not just a, uh, uh, you know, colo discussion. It is the network is part of it, and once you put those two together, then all those with content are going to are going to want to follow. But uh, obviously, like I said, the network is uh, as instrumental as just the, the buildings that uh, the applications are going to sit in. 
and, 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 and the design to make sure that the density of connectivity, which as you said, you said the right thing, Chris, it's not going to be a hard carrier. It could be, probably won't be, but they're still going to push a lot of data and they can never, ever, ever go down, which means that you can't ever have a physical design for a building and the surrounding area where one dude with a backhoe, because they're out there, they're out there right now, right? Where one dude with the backhoe can take down your facility, right? It's got to be a whole fleet of dudes with backhoes, right? So that's, right, so density isn't all, the, the model's changing, right? Density used to be how many servers, how many megawatts, and now we think, for me, it's about how many ones and zeros we push through and how do we keep them pushing through? Because you know what happens when this thing goes down? My phone crashed last night, right? So I know what this is like. This thing turned into a brick. But when this thing goes down, we all get really grumpy and we can't do anything anymore, right? And that's the thing that's really driving the business, reliability at scale. That's right. We got one minute. No, and it, it's it's all about experience, right? So, and, and the experience is key. It it doesn't matter how it's how it's uh, architected. It's it's all about uh, the experience. And the challenge we're having here, with the technical difficulties, is is uh, is somewhat challenging. Uh, but uh, I I completely understand. At this point, we have just a few minutes left. Uh, I just for uh, our panelists. Alyssa, did we want to go ahead and have a few Q and A? Happy to do a Q and A with these group, these group folks. Um, you know, it's um, doing a live event is always fun. So uh, first off, I, I thank everybody. Um, you know, for bearing with us. Um, th this one we had a couple of issues with, with latency, of course, with voice, um, and with Jeff, and so. How, let, let's make this, you know, okay, really guys. about uh, the any closing comments work. that you would want to provide for audience today. We, again, we have uh, just a few more minutes. I'll we'll start with you, right. Jeff. Oh, closing comments? Is that what you want? Um, I don't know. I don't know what to say. You know, this is, it, it, it's been an adventure. Um, you know, I'm, the, I'm the longest tenured. Sorry, Jeff. My apologies. Yes, please. Okay, yeah. So I'm, I'm the longest tenured uh, employee at the Royal DC Block. It's been a fun. It's been a fun ride to go all the way from Congress on that end. To, to building data centers, having made a few mistakes, you know, a few miscalculations as to where the market was going and what the customers wanted, but to adapt to that and, and really recognize that even in the case of a pandemic, that you know what we did is fundamentally sound, that the, the bet we made heavily on connectivity uh, has come back to pay dividends in, in crazy ways, and we think that accelerates. We didn't get a chance to talk about 5G, but you know, the, the edge-connected data center, I think, is the future. Uh, can't, can't lose the hubs in the big cities, but um, it's been a delight to be part of this of this adventure and there's a lot of great times ahead and I'm looking forward to uh, being in his business with all, you, all you folks. So thank you for having me and uh, for considering to see Blocks to be part of this today. All right, I'll take, I'll take it around to the next closing comment. Um, yeah, I, I appreciate uh, Tom, Melissa, you guys uh, putting this all together. Uh, I, I think in similar to what said, it's a very exciting time um, I don't know if Tom was trying to say anything. And, and I really, it's the same thing I tell Bluebird employees. I mean, it is such a privilege to get to be in this industry. Uh, and, I, and I say this infrastructure in, industry because, you know, whether that's better education for our student, our kids and students, better healthcare, uh, more access to news, media, uh, better connect with people, all of these great things, better efficiencies in in retail, it, it just these things won't happen. These technologies won't be able to innovate uh, without the infrastructure uh, at the edge, the fiber, the data center. Uh, add in the cell towers, which was a prior topic. Uh, so it is exciting to be in this, and and it's all, it's even more exciting that there's a lot of things we think are going to happen, and to just be part of the ride and see what evolves over the next five to ten years. Exactly. You. Absolutely. <laughs> well said, both of you, Bruce and Jeff. Um, what's very interesting is uh, the, the killer app that everybody likes to talk about. It's not it's not here yet. Um, and what's crazy is it's not only not here yet, but the guys that can develop that kill, killer app, OK, are waiting for exactly what we're building to get out there. They want to see that we have a chicken and egg 
Um, COVID kind of pushed it a little bit. You know, all of us speaking and pushing out our infrastructure and showing people that it can be done has pushed it a little bit further. Um, but for example, you know, you know, we're trying to solve some gaming um, issues, um, uh, some issues for the gaming industry. Um, and what's interesting is they're like, no, 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 no. That, there's just no infrastructure there. I'm like, well, hold on. Let me go there. Okay. And all of a sudden that changes the entire dialogue. We've got essentially a, a hub and spoke uh, fiber network that's out there. But our software developers have been building a logical web uh, mesh for years. Okay. It's only now that we've actually started to actually deploy mesh networks. So so the point is when you've got, now granted we've been doing it for the last couple of years, but uh, everything, for, again, all the cell towers that I had built up fiber tool four years ago, uh, not myself, but the industry, it was all going back to centralized locations and and people were trying to say, but I need, to, I need that to go over here. And what happened was, People would have to write code to be able to get it over there. And the issue here is when the, the the software side and the telecom side do come together and they're talking about the same assets, um, uh, that's where you're going to start seeing a lot of innovation and where you can have a lot of localization um, and not have it, you know, crumple the system, um, which it can do, and which we've actually, in our own experiences, just within the last 12 months of this pandemic, have seen. Uh, it's very exciting. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, guys. I, I definitely agree. Um, you know, on our community board, uh, there have been some discussions there in regards to um, edge. And um, I did throw a comment in there, right? That we need more distribution. It can't be just a hub and spoke, right? We need to have more distribution, um, more reach. Um, you know, we need to stretch things out and, you um, Every single one of you are doing that, right, in your businesses uh, in a very complementary way uh, with the network infrastructure, um, you know, coupled with the facilities, coupled with the locations, coupled with, you know, the size of facility, um, you know, and the focus of facility from interconnection, right, to, to you know, hyperscale and enterprise grade um, to highly secure um, capabilities. It, it's really remarkable that, uh, we need this, right? We need it all. Um, it's not one size fits all. It's all sorts of sizes makes it happen. Um, and I can't thank you guys enough for all being here.